On March the 22nd, 1941, the two German capital ships entered the German-occupied port of Brest in France to carry out much-needed repairs. These two ships had just come back from Operation Berlin, during which they sank 22 Allied merchant vessels in just two months, making the mission a great success. The presence of these two capital ships in the port posed a serious threat to the merchant convoy passing through the Atlantic sea route. Both of these were battlecruisers, the Scharnhorst and her sister ship, the Gneisenau. Both ships weighed around 32,000 tons, had a top speed of 32 knots, and were equipped with nine 11-inch guns. They were built with armored plating and were able to withstand a great deal of damage. Scharnhorst's observations showed that the long trip had caused several serious defects in her boiler. On the other hand, only minor repairs were needed to bring Gneisenau back to sea again. Repairs to both ships at the port were soon undertaken by German dockyard workers. The Germans banned local workers because the French resistance had agents who were delivering information to the British from the port. Six days after their arrival, the Royal Air Force's reconnaissance aircraft detected their presence. The Admiralty called on the RAF to take necessary action while the ships were anchored within the port, as it was an opportunity they couldn't afford to miss. The port of Brest was within range of the Bomber Command. On the night of March the 30th to the 31st, 109 RAF bomber aircrafts attacked the port of Brest and dropped about 130 tons of bombs, but their impact on battlecruisers was minor. Day by day, more air raids were carried out by the RAF. There was also a retaliatory response from the port by the Germans, with anti-aircraft guns and searchlights aimed at the sky. On the 5th of April, Gneisenau was taken out of dry dock and moored to a buoy in the inner harbour. After studying the position of Scharnhorst and Gneisenau with the help of aerial reconnaissance sorties, the Coastal Commandway sent a four twin-engine Bristol Beaufort aircraft carrying torpedoes to attack them. Three failed to find a target, but the fourth, flown by Flying Officer Kenneth Campbell at a low altitude, launched a torpedo after approaching the ship. His projectile ran straight and exploded against the rear of the Gneisenau, wrecking the starboard propeller and its shaft. His plane crashed after being hit by heavy anti-aircraft fire. Inspections revealed that Gneisenau would take six months to repair due to the torpedo damage. To avoid continued attacks by the RAF, the port of Brest was turned into a fortress by the Germans. Further anti-aircraft defenses were enhanced and smoke generators were installed to cover the ship's position in smoke. In late May, the German battleship Bismarck was sunk by the overwhelming force of the British Navy. The Navy was seeking revenge for the sinking of their pride and joy, the HMS Hood, which was sunk by Bismarck on the 24th of May during the Battle of the Denmark Strait. Surviving a British naval search, Bismarck's escort ship, the heavy cruiser Prince Eugen, arrived in Brest Harbour on the 1st of June. She was moved to the dry dock for repairs. Repairs continued until the end of the month. On the 1st of July, an air raid was carried out by the RAF, in which an armor-piercing bomb fell on her. About 47 crew were killed in the blast damage. Repairs were expected to take up to three months. Three weeks after the incident, on the 21st of July, the Scharnhorst repairs were completed. She was sent to the small French harbor of La Palisse in the south. During the 250-mile voyage, the battlecruiser's repaired boilers were tested and her guns were put into practice, but the RAF detected this movement. The Admiralty felt that the German ship was about to attempt a breakout into the Atlantic. To counter such a possibility, she was attacked three times in 24 hours by the RAF on the 24th of July. She was hit several times by these attacks. The onboard crew managed to patch up the damage caused by the air raid. The very next day, she was brought back to the dry dock at Brest. Now, the three German warships were reunited at the port of Brest. On the other hand, Bismarck's sister ship, Tirpitz, was in the port of Kiel. The RAF frequently conducted air raids on her, but these were not successful due to her position on the Baltic sea coast. Meanwhile, Germany had formed a new front open against the Soviet Union. With Tirpitz, a temporary Baltic fleet was built to prevent the breakout of the Soviet fleet based in Leningrad. Apart from all this, Britain was carrying out many raids in German-occupied Norway. The Führer was concerned that Norway was at great risk of invasion from Allied forces. The Norwegian waters were crucial to Germany's wartime operation and to preventing the Soviet Allied convoy. 
so the Führer decided that the ships would be better deployed there. According to Admiral Reda, Commander-in-Chief of Kriegsmarine, the presence of three German warships in Brest was a constant threat to Allied merchant convoys, and the ships should have been used as commerce raiders in the open Atlantic. He tried to put off returning them to Germany for as long as he could. But then, in a surprise attack on the US naval base at Pearl Harbor and two British warships, the HMS Repulse and the HMS Prince of Wales were sunk in a Japanese air raid. It became clear how long the three warships at Brest could last under the threat of British air raids. Repairs to three warships were nearing completion in December, despite a series of RAF bombings at the port of Brest. All three were about to leave the port, which was being monitored with the help of the French resistance and aerial reconnaissance sorties. In January 1942, the Tirpitz sailed to Norway to act as a deterrent against an Allied invasion. While stationed in Norway, Tirpitz was also intended to be used to intercept Allied convoys heading to the Soviet Union. In mid-January 1942, the Führer ordered all three ships to return to Germany to join the Norwegian fleet. But it was a challenge for the German naval command to decide on a route that would bring the ships safely back to Germany. There were two possible routes, first northwards towards Iceland, then east and south round the British Isles into the North Sea. Second, there was the more direct route through the English Channel to the German North Sea ports. The route via the English Channel would have taken them through the narrow passage of the Dover Straits, bringing the German ships into close proximity to the English coast. The ships would have to run the gauntlet of a great number of coastal artillery guns, bombers and naval warships, which seemed suicidal. Both routes were fraught with danger. Leaving the idea of the Icelandic route after Bismarck's accident, the Führer preferred the English Channel route, although Britain would likely retaliate fiercely in order to maintain control of the passage. The mission was named Operation Cerberus. On the other hand, if they were to leave the Brest and go out to raid in the Atlantic or Mediterranean Sea, higher levels of monitoring that area would become necessary. For this, the Coastal Command and Fighter Command continued regular base air patrolling. They monitored the movement of large German ships off the French coast through petrol lines such as Stopper, Line Southeast and Harbo. The English Channel was monitored by radar stations distributed along the south coast of England. Operation Fuller was launched by the British to deal with the situation if German warships passed through the English Channel. The Admiralty had avoided the deployment of its capital ships stationed at Scarpa Flow because if such an event were to occur, the British warships were at greater risk of attack from the German Air Force Luftwaffe. All three warships were now ready for the next mission after completing their repairs in Brest in early February 1942. The night of February 11, 1942 was dark, full of foul weather, and the tide was perfect for the operation. Under the command of Vice Admiral Otto Celiax, preparations were underway on all three ships, and the escort ships took their place. Around 2 p.m., the commander of the British submarine Celian, six miles from the port of Brest, took her 30 miles away to charge the batteries, as they noticed no suspicious movements. The time was 7.30 p.m. Under the command of Ciliax, the battle fleet began to cast off from their mooring stations, but at the same time, the air raid sirens sounded. The RAF's bomber planes arrived to bomb the port. The port searchlights were turned on, and a fog generator in the inner port of Brest covered the ships like a blanket. One bomb after another was dropped from RAF planes, but the ships were not damaged. Eventually, after some 90 minutes, the bombers left and the all-clear sounded. Vice Admiral Ciliax signaled to cast off once again. It was 9.30 p.m. when one by one the big German ships came out of the harbour. Ciliax was on board the Scharnhorst, behind which was the Gneisenau, and then the heavy cruiser Prince Eugen. The escort of six destroyers also ran alongside the warships. During this time, the second patrol line of Line Southeast, the Lockheed Hudson aircraft, was patrolling southeast from Ushant towards the island of Brehat, but was called back to the base at 9.39 p.m. due to a defect in its radar. Meanwhile, the German battle fleet was almost coming out of the mouth of Brest, 50 miles south. During this time, the second stopper Hudson aircraft continued patrolling along a dogleg course off Brest. 
but no movement was seen on the radar screen and the aircraft headed for its base. At midnight, the Ciliac's battle fleet was passing through Ushant and was advancing at a speed of 27 knots. The German battle fleet then altered course to starboard to enter the English Channel. At around 1.15 a.m. on the 12th of February, the first Harbo patrol aircraft was doing its routine patrolling at Le Havre near the French coast, which lasted as far as Cherbourg. At 1.25 a.m., the German battle fleet was heading northeast towards the German-occupied Channel Island. At half four in the morning, another Harbo patrol began, which flew from Cherbourg westward to the Bay of Seine, completing a triangular route covering both the inner bay and the outer patrol line. This patrol lasted about two hours and consisted of two circuits and then returned to the base, but the distant German ships were still out of reach. At 7.15 a.m., a German battle fleet was passing through Cherbourg. Thirty minutes later, on board Scharnhorst, Vice Admiral Ciliax ordered all crew members to be ready at their battle stations. Shortly afterwards, German fighter planes came roaring from astern the warships. Then they climbed to operational altitude, where they began flying a circular pattern over the fleet. The British were still utterly ignorant of the presence of the German battle fleet in the Channel. At 8.20 a.m., suspicious aircrafts appeared off the French coast on a radar screen at Beachy Head and began flying in a circular pattern. Reports of these movements reached the Fighter Command and then the Naval Command. Half an hour later, two Spitfire planes landed on the Jim Crow mission, the first flying from Cap Glenny to Flushing and another from Cap Glenny to Le Havre. An aircraft flying southward saw the escort e-boats leaving Boulogne and headed southwards. Special aerial reconnaissance was ordered by examining radar input from Dover Command. At 10.20 a.m., two Spitfire planes launched a search operation. The pilot of the Spitfire plane saw two lines of e-boats with a total of nine crafts heading east along the channel. But due to the special reconnaissance mission by maintaining the radio silence, it was still too late for this information to reach the base. During this time, two other Spitfire planes were also flying south from Bologna. They saw a German battle fleet five miles off the coast of Le Touquet at 10.40 a.m but they retreated immediately as they were attacked by the German fighter planes. Both planes returned to Kenley Airfield while maintaining complete radio silence. The German fleet was now heading safely towards Dover. Information about the input on the radar screen during the time of 11.05 a.m. and accurate information obtained with the help of aerial reconnaissance had now reached the British command center. The ships were recognized as being hostile. Operation Fuller was now in action. Fighter, coastal and bomber commands were kept on high alert and information on the position and speed of ships was provided to the command center. Vice Admiral Ramsey was in command of the operation at Dover headquarters. He immediately ordered the motor torpedo boats and slow swordfish planes equipped with torpedoes to attack. The German battle fleet was now passing through the Cap Glenny. The four 9.2-inch guns located on South Foreland were more effective in reaching the German ships that were soon to pass through the Strait of Dover. The positions of the German ships obtained from British radar was reported to coastal artillery guns. At 12.19 p.m., South Foreland batteries began firing on German ships, but the fired shells were falling about a mile astern of the German escort ship. At 12.23 p.m., the British motor torpedo boats were heading towards the battle fleet. They tried to break through the e-boat screen, which brought them under intensive fire but most of them could not penetrate the shield of the e-boat. One torpedo after another was released from the MTBs. Despite relentless efforts from MTBs, these torpedoes did not successfully hit any of their targets. However, the response from the Germans heavily damaged the motor torpedo boats. During the attack by the Dover MTBs, the German defenders on the ships and in the air were distracted by the arrival of British swordfish torpedo planes from the 825 Squadron Fleet Air Arm. German ships, meanwhile, were advancing 12 miles from Calais and at a speed of 30 knots. Not all of the swordfish aircraft survived the German ship's heavy attack. The last round was fired by the coastal artillery gun as the German fleet sailed out of reach. Vice Admiral Ciliax's ships had run the gauntlet of 33 rounds from the British heavy guns and had remained intact. 
Three more motor torpedo boats from Ramsgate failed to make contact with the German heavy units. The main part of the German battle squadron had passed ahead of it to the northeast. Attacks by the British, including coastal guns, MTBs, fighter aircraft and torpedo bombers, failed to cause further damage to German ships. The battle fleet was now steaming towards the North Sea. At about 2.32 pm, the Scharnhorst was hit by a British-mounted minefield. Scharnhorst was completely halted due to the violent explosion on her starboard side. But following the mission, both Gneisenau and Prince Eugen passed her and began to move forward. Siliax left his flagship aboard Scharnhorst and was transferred to destroyer Z-29. Efforts were being made by the onboard crew to bring Scharnhorst back into service. Her boiler was fixed around 3 p.m., but by that point, the main body was 17 miles away from her. RAF bombers attacked the main fleet at around 3.45 p.m. Over 240 Beaufort, Manchester and Wellington bombers had been sent to find the fleet. The Manchesters and Wellingtons struggle with the low clouds and fighter escorts and fail to hit any targets. The German ships were found at a time when a full-scale dogfight between the RAF and the Luftwaffe was going on overhead. A few of the Beauforts managed to attack despite very poor visibility and a high number of enemy fighters. The Beauforts struggled to find their targets and were also harassed by the Luftwaffe. They also came under heavy fire from the German body's anti-aircraft guns. Shortly afterwards, five British destroyers were advancing towards the German battle fleet. They approached the German destroyer escort and fired. The two destroyers launched their torpedoes but failed to hit the target. Another destroyer, Worcester, approached the battle fleet and launched its torpedo at a range of about 4,000 yards. By then, the German ships were taking evasive action. Worcester, which was drifting away from the German ships, was badly damaged by a salvo of heavy shells fired from the big German ships. Two other destroyers attacked the heavy German cruiser, Prince Eugen, launching a torpedo in the range of between 4,000 and 3,000 yards, but they also missed their target. The German ships suffered no significant damage from the British destroyer's attack. At 6.10 p.m. as the evening fell, the RAF called back the last of the 242 bombers, signaling the failure of Operation Fuller. The German ships had escaped their pursuers. Gneisenau and Prince Eugen, both now far from each other due to poor visibility, continued independently. At 6.32 p.m., the ships reached the channel of Texel in the Frisian Islands and began to travel northeast. The ships were due to pass through the Dutch coast, but the mines laid by the RAF posed a great danger. At 7.55 p.m., the Gneisenau succumbed to an underwater explosion off the Dutch island of Terschelling. One of the engines stopped immediately after the blast. It took about 30 minutes to repair the ship. Prince Eugen, who was behind her, managed to escape from the minefield without issue. At 9.35 p.m., off the same island of Terschelling, misfortune again struck the Scharnhorst. The ship hit another mine and was once more rendered dead in the water. Her starboard side engine was damaged. By 10.15 p.m., the battlecruiser was underway again. By the end of that day, the three great warships had reached home waters. Just after midnight, Gneisenau and Prince Eugen made contact and escorted each other towards the small German port of Brunsbüttel at the southern end of the Kiel Canal on the banks of the River Elbe. They arrived just before dawn. The Scharnhorst took longer to get home and arrived at the naval port of Wilhelmshaven later that morning. The dash through the English Channel was seen as a great German victory. It was a bold and carefully planned operation that showed the indefatigable spirit of the officers and men of the Kriegsmarine and their comrades in the Luftwaffe. Operation Cerberus was the last victory for the Scharnhorst, Gneisenau and the Prince Eugen, for their ultimate fates were tragic. What happened to these three ships after this operation? We will discuss this in a separate video.